I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, all five of my Noé Frère flutes. I realized as I was demonstrating the individual instruments that they actually show quite a good picture of the development of the flute uh, in France for the first part of the 19th century. So I thought I would sort of go through each one of those flutes and show you some of the details that, uh, that inform us about these flutes. So the oldest one, um, of course, they don't have dates on them, but as, as I will discuss, there are various ways that we can use to determine the, at least the relative age of these instruments. <clears throat> so the, uh, the oldest of the group is the, uh, what I call the one plus one key flute. This flute was built as a one key flute, uh, probably fairly early in the 19th century. Uh, we have the one key here, uh, but we have uh, an interesting thing which we find in other flutes as well, and that is that the person who owned this, who was a well-known flute player, had a B flat key added to the flute. So this was just a regular one key flute, and then at some point, um, fairly early on, this key was added. Uh, we know that it was added uh, quite early because the style of the key itself and the key mount is the sort of thing you would have seen in 1820, 1825, in that area. Um, <clears throat> I have other flutes in my collection with similar sort of additions that happened along the way in order to make the flute a little more modern, make it have some of the conveniences and without the person having to buy a new flute. So uh, this flute uh, was owned by a very famous flute player. The, the owner was named Jean-Baptiste Lepin. He was born in 1784. We don't really know when he died but he was a student at the Paris Conservatory along with, uh, with Toulou. And actually he won a first prize at the conservatory the year before Toulou won his first prize. So he was a very famous uh, flute player. Uh, we know that this flute belonged to him um, as well as a couple of other flutes in my collection because this flute has the initials JBL uh, stamped on it. And um, we uh, also know, I know from the person who uh, originally got hold of these flutes that the family they came from was the Le Pin family. So I think we're, we can be 95% sure these, this flute and two other flutes in my collection were flutes that belonged to him. So uh, a distinguishing factor is the shape of the key, uh, the wooden mount, and the brass key with a square, uh, a square end. So that was a design that came out of the 18th century. Other aspects of the flute are it's made of boxwood and it has horn rings. Um, this was uh, probably not a, considered a fancy flute at the time, although it was made in the period where one key flute was very common. The next flute, um, I believe, chronologically would be this one, uh, which is the first flute that I played on my uh, other demonstration of the Noé flutes. So this is a one key flute. Uh, and this flute comes with these other two middle joints so that it could play at a variety of pitches. It, it plays from a little below 430 to uh, right about 440. And uh, very beautiful, beautifully made flute in, in pretty much perfect condition. And again, um, the key tells us a lot about the, uh, the dating of this flute relative to other styles of keys. This is what was called an abascule key. And the, the important factor of that is the 
the pad for the key has a hinge in it. And so uh, the idea is that it levels itself over the hole. If I, if I push it askew and then I just drop it down on the hole, it's then level. And the idea was that that would more likely give a good seal. Uh, we find this type of key on uh, a fair number of flutes. It was probably uh, something you had to pay a bit for because making them was uh, complicated. Um, <clears throat> the next flute would be this one. And here the main difference is that the flute incorporates a tuning slide. So. The previous flute, we had to use interchangeable middle joints to achieve different pitches, but here we have the tuning slide, which can be pulled in and out. It's a metal against metal uh, sleeve. Uh, we have <clears throat> the same kind of key, the Abascul key. In this case, uh, when I acquired this flute, it had a, a later key that had been put on here. It clearly was not the original key. So I had this key uh, made as a copy of the key from my other flute and it worked quite successfully. It had exactly the same kind of hinge. Um, another sort of early feature to notice is this, the mount um, where the posts mount on the key is rectangular. It's not uh, in one of the fancier shapes uh, even in the, the other one, uh, it has a kind of a fancier design, <clears throat> which was typical at the time. The, uh, the next step was going from the one key flute to what was first the four key flute. Four key flutes were very common in France and it was the, the four key flute that kind of got the idea of keys going. And so a four key flute had a B flat key, had a G sharp key, it had the D sharp key, and it had an F natural key. And then this flute is a six key flute, which was uh, kind of the, the more deluxe standard version. Uh, and it has, in addition to those four keys, a C key, and a key called the long F. Uh, the F is a complicated thing because in order to go from D to F on this flute, I would have to pick up this finger and then move it over here like that. And to try to do that when it's the music is slurred is very difficult. And so they invented a, a duplicate F key that you could use with your little finger. So now if I go D, D to, to D to F, it's very, very easy. Um, so the, uh, the next step would be the eight key flute. In France, the eight key flute was not nearly as big a deal as it was in countries like England. In, in England, very quickly, they went from a one key flute to experimenting with some keys and then kind of settling in on the idea that the basic concert flute, as they would call it, had eight keys. In France, the, the flute didn't need to go down to C in most cases. So if, if you look at flute music from the first half of the 19th century that was really French, uh, not sort of composed for a foreign audience, you see that that music only goes down to a D. It doesn't go down to C sharp or C. However, if you wanted to play music from Germany or from England or from Italy, you needed to have the C foot. So uh, very often we find, especially in fancy or flutes, that they would come with both a C foot and a D foot. And that's because people believed, and, and I think I agree with them, that the flute actually works a little better with the D foot than it does with the C foot. The C foot kind of uh, confuses some things a little bit. Although there are other people who, who are, would argue that the C foot makes the flute work better. That hasn't really been my experience. So anyway, we have for, for the eight keys, we have B flat, C, G sharp, long F, short F, 
D sharp, C sharp, and C. Uh, this has got a very beautifully made foot joint. It has rollers on the C sharp and C that let you really easily slide from one place to the other so you can do things very smoothly without having to hop around onto the keys. Um, another thing that's interesting is uh, this does not have a tuning slide in the head joint, but it has uh, what, what I would call an integrated slide in that there's a little metal pocket. So uh, from at least about this point, this is still within the slide. And so this, this is very similar to this idea, a little more limited range, um, but it still allowed a little bit of tunability uh, over the other things. Another thing to notice, uh, which you can see in this photograph, is the similarity uh, in shape of the different embouchure holes of these five flutes. They uh, are not identical, uh, but they reflect the same philosophy uh, in the design of the, the French hole, which was to be uh, oval-shaped, fairly small. Uh, on the earliest example, uh, the boxwood flute, the hole is a little more elongated. And, uh, but it's interesting that the hole does not get any larger as the, uh, the instrument progresses in age. So the flute made in, say, 1845, as opposed to one made in 1810, there's not a difference in the size of the hole, really. And uh, that's different from what you would find in the case of English flutes, where they went from really quite a small hole to a considerably larger hole by 1845, and, and similarly uh, in Germany. I wanted to mention a little bit more about the, uh, the piece that I used to show these flutes. Uh, it, it was by uh, Ludovic Le Plu, who lived from 1806 to 1874. He is uh, virtually unknown today. Uh, there is some piece of his, I believe, uh, maybe one or two pieces of his that have been published in recent centuries, uh, but basically he uh, is, is unknown in today's uh, musical circles, including people who like French flute music. Um, he was quite a good composer um, and uh, well known as a flute player. He played in the uh, Opera Comique uh, Orchestra in Paris. Um, he is sometimes listed uh, in the sources as being first flute, and at least one place is listed as being third flute. Maybe he was those different things at different times, we don't really know. But he was very well established. He composed quite a bit of flute music. The, uh, the source that uh, my piece in the demonstrations is from is uh, a little collection of 14 pieces called Melody. Um, and <clears throat> they're just short uh, pieces, less, less than a page a piece, written for presumably solo flute. Um, <clears throat> there is another set of 14 as well, um, but uh, the, the collection that I have, the manuscript that, that I have, only has the, the first of these 14.